Ben, you know, he's he's got a good point, actually. Um, the First Amendment, you know, is is obviously very important to protect our right to protest and have political demonstrations and and discuss really substantive important things. And yet we're doing this whole analysis about the First Amendment for videos of people stepping on animals to get sexual pleasure. How on earth does the First Amendment even cover something like this? You know, it's it's extremely important to, under, to, to understand up front that the First Amendment does not just apply to political speech. Whether it was meant to or not when it was drafted, it doesn't say that. So on its face, it protects speech, period. Um, in this case, we have something that to some people may have redeeming artistic merit. To some people, it might not. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not speech, and that doesn't mean it's unprotected speech. So you're right. It, it does pale in comparison to you know the the Tea Party movement, right? Which is which is a current movement that is you know political speech. No one would think that that would be unprotected. But just because this isn't political, because it's artistic, um, doesn't mean it's not speech and it's not protected. And I think to suggest otherwise undersells the importance that art and music and you know drama and other forms of artistic speech have have you know the, what they've contributed to our to our society and our culture. That is a really good answer. Well, whether I believe it or not is is one thing, but. <laughs> You are a good lawyer, my friend. But let's get back to the second part of our constitutional analysis. Um, so had we already decided that protecting animals was a compelling interest? So let's assume for the sake of argument that, that, it, if it, that, it, that it becomes a compelling state interest. Now remember to go back to where this started. That then means it's past the first part of the test. Okay, all right. So let's just be clear where we are right now. We are assuming now that even with Lady Justice's thumb pushed all the way down on the side of individual rights, the Supreme Court may still find that preventing animal cruelty could be a compelling enough interest to outweigh those First Amendment speech rights. So we move on to the second part of the test. Now the court will determine if it's narrowly tailored to further that interest. Right. And when you talk about narrowly tailored, you ask... Is it written in such a fashion that it does not impinge upon speech it's not intended to impinge upon? So, is right. it, is, Matt, is it possible that this law, as written, could reach speech that has nothing to do with animal cruelty? Well, yes, actually, and this has been a major sticking point for detractors of this law. It's not too hard to come up with some examples. Let's say that you decided to go to Spain and film a bullfight. Now, of course, bullfighting is legal in Spain, but it is illegal in all 50 states of America. So if you try to come back to the states and sell your bullfighting film, you could conceivably be prosecuted. And so that would mean that all those TV shows that show videos of the Pamplona races... The running of the bulls? Yeah. Yeah, they kill the bulls at the end, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, that could be outlawed. Now, let's not forget about that exception built into the law for anything of serious artistic, journalistic, etc. value. The problem there is, who decides if your speech has serious value? In fact, when this law was being debated on the House floor, a certain Ron Paul, yes, that Ron Paul, who is and was a Texas representative, had similar misgivings. I just think that the qualifications in here to exempt certain people, uh, like journalistic and historical and artistic, uh, these categories, uh, quite frankly, who will be the judge? Very difficult to do. Well, in this case, there are several possible judges. A prosecutor who could bring a case against you if he doesn't like what you've said, a jury who may or may not think that what you've said has serious artistic or whatever value, or an actual judge sitting on the bench. Now, I don't know about you, but I would not want to trust my constitutional rights to a group of people I don't know who may or may not think that whatever I've produced has serious value. And it's not just bullfighting. What about organizations like PETA, 
who publish information showing cruelty to animals in order to gain support for their cause, which is preventing cruelty to animals. They would probably fall under the political value exception to the law, but again, it's up to the local prosecutor to decide whether or not to charge you with breaking the law. So we just watched this, this movie, and it's about the commercial food industry. And there's, you know, those pictures of um, the, anim- the cows especially, right, being... It's really cruel what they do to these cows. They have footage, right? They've packaged it into this nice little movie, and then they send it to me in, on Netflix. Are they violating this law? They're depicting animal cruelty. Say, say a prosecutor or a judge who happens to be elected in a community in which a meatpacking plant operates. If they were elected where a meat plant is... Yeah, they would want to shut Food Inc. down for violating this law. You know, I didn't even think about that. Because, right, these meat plants operate, and, and their, their, their margins are so thin that they're only able to make money if they can pretty much operate their business that factors in very cruel treatment of the animals. So you're thinking of politically motivated prosecutions against people who make these sorts of films if it's in a town where these industries are very crucial to the town's vitality. But wouldn't a judge see right through that? The important thing to note is bringing the case is is a distinction from, you know, winning the case. I mean, you're going to put these guys through hell and back if you if you file this against them. But in any event, it creates an avenue by which that could be done. So this is this is a really strong argument for the overbroadness of this law. And if you think about it, the very fact that the first case ever prosecuted under this crushing law was not for crushing at all, but for dogfighting videos, strongly implies that the language of the law is really overbroad. And if it's overbroad, that means it's not narrowly tailored. It means it fails the second part of the test. So it fails the second part of the test, and it already failed the first part of the test, the compelling interest in our little analysis. So there is no way that the Supreme Court is going to find that this law as written, is constitutional, right? I mean, what do you think, Ben? I mean, at the end of the day, I think you're talking about abridging speech to further uh, a dog. I, 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 don't think that, I don't think that adds up. What do you have against dogs, Ben? I have nothing against dogs. I have everything for the First Amendment. So, I mean, we're, we're, in a, we're balancing here. I love dogs. But when you're talking about abridging somebody, you know, speech... You better have a really good reason to do it. Animals? I don't know. I just I don't I don't I think I think you have to you have to you have to have like a like a like a balance, right? And if the right at issue weighs more than the interest at issue, then the law can't can't go. And the right at issue here is speech and the interest at issue here is animals, and I think speech weighs more. The Supreme Court should be deciding this case within the next couple of months, so when it does, we will keep you updated on our website, lex-appeal.com. There you can find information relating to each show, including, for instance, the grape-squishing video from today, legal briefs related to each case we've talked about, any developments about the cases, and show archives. Um when we have some more shows to archive. I I should point out I hate websites with hyphens in them. I should point out that lexappeal.com without a hyphen was taken. What if you did L-E-K-S appeal? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Somehow I think the people who would spell it that way are probably not listening. I'd like to thank all the musicians for providing the ambience for today's show, especially Bo Finley of Panda Fuzz Records. And you can find links to all the music on our website. Thanks again for listening to our inaugural show. And if you take nothing else from this episode, just promise me this. If you ever have kids who like to be stepped on, please get them counseling. I remember as far back as two or three years old, I I always, and I don't know why I did this, but I was constantly trying to get people to step on me. I'm Matt Schwartz. I'm Ben Steffens. Until next time. Goodbye. Goodbye.